All right, let's go. You can go with the uh, first slide. Hello, everyone. And if we just click on the present button. Um, <laughs> Um, to the far right, uh, near the yellow share button, then there is a button to present. Uh, okay. All right, so hello everyone uh, for our continuing um, webinar series on uh, data science. Um, if we advance to the next slide. <laughs> Um, so some of you may have been here for our previous um, speakers like Patrick Riley or Rama or Sarah or Maxime. Those webinars are now available on YouTube for your viewing enjoyment. Um, we'll try to split those as we have time. Um, let's see, maybe next slide. Um, we have some upcoming webinars uh, from um, Hendrik and our very own uh, Mohammed. Um, so stay tuned. We'll announce when registration for that is ready. Um, on the next slide, we also have a uh, GDS tutorial coming up where we'll talk to you about um, active learning and computational and autonomous experiments. Also, as a uh, procedural note, one of the things that we have learned is that if you're just going through the web interface, you may have audio issues. And so you will probably want to download the app um, for a better um, experience. And again, we will be posting um, videos on uh, YouTube um, as this continues. Um, also, on the next slide, we'll show you a little bit about our social media. Um, so please go ahead um, and follow us, be it on LinkedIn or Twitter or uh, Facebook, then uh, there are many possibilities for getting in touch with us. And um, yeah, we hope that you have a um, good experience today. And Chung Chen will introduce um, the speakers for today's talk. I'm William Ratcliffe. I'm the secretary of the topical group on data science. Hey, thank you, William. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Zhen Chen Chen from University of Alabama at Birmingham. I uh, am one of the executive, executive uh, committee members for the APS GTS group. So, uh, I'll be helping uh, chairing today's sections, and it's a great pleasure to have two distinguished speakers today. So, uh, I'll be introducing their talk soon and uh, before that I want to mention so if you during the talk if you have if you have questions you can post them in the uh, question tab so in the end of the talk I will help uh, read out the questions or I can unmute the people who ask ask a questions to uh, interact with the speakers uh, directly and also uh, for now please help me uh, complete this um, A uh, quick poll about how did you hear about this uh, uh, webinar? Okay. In meanwhile, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker. So it's great, a uh, great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Alexander Trapsha here. So Dr. Trapsha is a PhD distinguished professor and uh, associate dean for data and data science at University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. His research interests are in the areas of computer-assisted drug design, computational toxicology, chem chemical informatics, nanomaterials informatics, and structural bioinformatics. He has co-authored uh, more than 230 peer-reviewed research papers, reviews, and book chapters, and co-edited co edited two monographs. His research has been supported by multiple grants from NIH, NSF, DOD, and the private companies. Okay, so uh, uh, welcome, Alexander. So I'll change you to the speaker and please go ahead when you are ready. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good. Uh, let's see. Can you hear me now? 
Okay. Yes. And you could and you see the screen. Please confirm. Yes, yes, please. Okay, all right. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, wherever everybody is. Um, pleased to speak today. Um, that would have been an introductory lecture for the uh, in-person uh, symposium. Um, and I hope everybody stays safe, at least we're out, at least six feet from each other. So uh, what I would like to share is um, a sort of high level um, discussion on um, the use of big data and machine learning um, for analyzing and designing novel materials. And I'll provide some background information as to how uh, methodologists that we and others have developed uh, entered the field of material science and how uh, we have been using this methodology uh, for the task of uh, material design. So um, I'll talk in more general sense about uh, machine learning applications to material science in the context of data science and data cycle. Um, a lot of developments uh, that, that has been done in our groups and perhaps in others uh, have some roots in um, the older the materials informatics field of CAM informatics. And so um, I'll talk about that background um, and uh, some applications to materials design. Um, and then I'll talk about methodologies that have not yet uh, entered the field of material science, but I think are on the brisk of entering, which is um, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, methods used to uh, design novel compounds. And I'll use examples from uh, chem informatics applications. And uh, some of the uh, major um, publications uh, listed on this front slide. So, um, so why now and uh, what can we do? Uh, that's that's brief introductory slide just to emphasize that any informatics research is enabled by the data uh, and uh, large data and we certainly are experiencing or have been experiencing the growth in uh, databases that are relevant to chemical design and material design. And I list a few of those on this front slide. Uh, structural data uh, is important uh, because that gives us a way of characterizing uh, materials. Uh, experimental uh, property data is uh, um, critical to link structural data to and model structure experimental property relationships. Computational data that I will talk a little bit about um, is important because for many uh, physical property prediction and calculation, computationally generated data uh, have shown uh, relevance. And of course, uh, informatics applications to chemistry and materials, uh, biology, makes sense when um, we need to use models to explore a vast design space from which we want to select uh, um, a subset of novel materials that is make sense to synthesize and test. So this winnowing down the, the possibilities uh, is one of the major applications of computer uh, modeling. And uh, something I'll briefly mention at um, the end is that um, what also helps uh, integration of computations and experiment is that uh, in the past decade, it has been a dramatic increase in the experimental throughput and uh, growing application of automation in chemical research. And that is great for modelers because um, um, we model big data, we output models that are applicable to big data. And so most of the time, uh, statistical models are uh, relatively poor in predicting a single point. Uh, they're greater at uh, predicting a selection of new substances and, and uh, forecasting the average expected accuracy um, for testing the selection. And so because of this experimental throughput, it's important to realize that the barriers to the experimental testing of predicted new substances and materials are um, relatively low. And so this is my starting point to sort of justify why we're talking today about growing uh, uh, application of materials uh, informatics uh, in experimental materials research. Um, it would be important uh, just to sort of introduce uh, the field uh, to reflect briefly on uh, the methodologies that have been considered historically in processing and analyzing uh, chemical matter. And uh, this slide briefly shows the evolution 
if you will, of this uh, approach is not that they, maybe evolution is not the right term, but a summary of major approaches that have been used in characterizing chemical structure, uh, going from um, historical application of quantum mechanics and ab initio, methods that uh, have been applied to characterize uh, uh, molecular matter, but um, have natural limitation into how fast uh, and how large the systems are that we could characterize. Uh, molecular mechanics, which uh, is uh, less theoretical in nature um, and uh, faster and allows to process large uh, molecular and macromolecular systems. And cheminformatics had emerged as perhaps the latest um, theoretical chemistry discipline, uh, which features unique representation of molecules um, as you compare the representation on the right hand side um, unique as compared to quantum mechanical or molecular mechanics view of chemical matter. Um, in cheminformatics, molecules are represented as objects in multidimensional chemical space, which is fully defined by so-called chemical descriptors. And uh, that representation and the ability to analyze that representation using statistical machine learning and more recently artificial intelligence tools is critical to the core of material informatics applications so that that evolution uh, and the coexistence of uh, this approach is important to um, realize as part of the theoretical analysis of data in materials informatics. And so um, the core aspect of uh, this view of molecular matter is the ability to characterize individual compounds by a, a collection of uh, chemical descriptors or in more general sense object characteristics or variables in, uh, in, in the context of statistical modeling, uh, where each chemical object, each material, each chemical compound uh, uh, characterized by a profile of descriptors that can be either computed from uh, the structure of the molecule or uh, relatively rapidly measured in physical experiments the important aspect to recognize and realize is that um, the, um, this, this representation is unique in that, that um, for each chemical in the data set, there is a multiple standard ways of characterizing certain aspects of the chemical structure. We talk about organic molecules, the simplest examples of chemical descriptors would be molecular weight or a number of carbon atoms. And then uh, there are much more sophisticated ways of characterizing chemical um, structure uh, based on uh, chemical graph theory, which um, historically in cheminformatics has been used to produce uh, hundreds and thousands of different molecular descriptors. The important part to recognize is that um, these profiles can be used to compare chemicals quantitatively in terms of their chemical similarity or diversity, as well as uh, to use these characteristics and building models that can predict uh, a special target property of the molecule that uh, could be uh, um, something as complex as, as uh, bioactivity or drug action or uh, physical properties uh, or el electronic properties of uh, uh, materials that, that can be um, uh, measured in experiments. Um, so um, in that regard, uh, and um, I assume most uh, listeners have uh, had some background in machine learning, but um, in the most sort of uh, simplistic uh, representation, we're talking about the use of those characteristics, uh, molecular features in uh, uh, empirical relationships uh, that are optimized in the process of model training to accurately predict the output and the output is, uh, again, any uh, measured or in some cases computed macro property of uh, molecular objects or materials that uh, is hypothesized to be related to this individual elementary multiple characteristics of uh, the same matter. And so the objective of machine learning models then is to uh, learn from past instances, uh, the empirical relationship between chemical characteristics and the target property, and then uh, build models that can be used uh, prospectively uh, with 
uh, standardized uh, parameters of the model or optimized uh, on the training set parameters of the model uh, to forecast uh, the property and uh, from this forecast um, we use models to guide subsequent experimental design. Um, this is um, to summarize um, the prior information. Uh, it's a, um, a paper that was published in Nature Reviews by um, our colleagues that uh, showed the evolution of um, uh, computational chemistry and uh, uh, the input of statistical modeling into computational chemistry. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about it, just to emphasize that machine learning approaches have proliferated into multiple areas of um, um, computational chemistry, including uh, areas as complex as energy and structure calculation. And so uh, what is, uh, and I think there are some talks uh, in this series about that there are um, very interesting emerging applications of statistical modeling um, to uh, augment and in some cases replac uh, replace even high level of initial calculations using statistical models uh, developed to uh, forecast electronic structure and property of chemical matter. And so um, I would encourage uh, those of you who are interested in uh, that aspect of uh, machine learning applications um, to um, uh, look uh, through papers cited on this um, uh, slide and, and other emergent papers on the use of machine learning for higher level um, ab initial quality calculations of chemical matter um, um, that, that shows how uh, deep learning and neural net models can be used in areas that have been traditionally reserved for uh, straightforward but slow ab initial calculations and uh, this is the sort of couple of slides that that shows uh, that particular evolution of uh, statistical modeling in uh, computational chemistry and applicability to um, high accuracy calculations so the um, uh, the diagram on the right hand side uh, for instance shows how accurate uh, a machine learning force field is in uh, reproducing energies uh, calculated uh, with DFT for the same large data set of molecules. So um, this, this was sort of the uh, um, introductory uh, part that uh, to cover uh, the basic elements that are considered important in understanding uh, how materials informatics um, um, has been developed and, and uh, what are the foundational principles behind materials informatics. Um, the objective that uh, one of the major objectives of, uh, of materials informatics is to uh, uh, go from the knowledge of material structure to characterization and prediction of materials property. And uh, what this slide shows is uh, kind of in parallel how this analysis is done in uh, current experimental labs where uh, material structure is characterized by experimental techniques such as X-ray diffraction, um, uh, from which um, one could calculate uh, molecular properties using uh, high-level ab initio methods. But in materials informatics, borrowing from chem informatics, um, what we have been doing is, is using a representation similar to what has been used in chem informatics to generate uh, theoretical fingerprints uh, or um, um, sort of uh, imagine here one of my previous slides when I was showing multiple properties or descriptors of chemical structures, which is the starting point of chem informatics. In materials informatics, uh, the critical step has been to come up with ways of um, generating a theoretical fingerprint of every material in the data set, which would enable uh, statistical modeling of structure property data analogous to uh, models known as quantitative structure property relationships um, in small organic molecules. Uh, here we're talking about materials, QSPR modeling, uh, that uh, essentially achieves the same objective, how to predict the property of the material from the knowledge of its structure, uh, but uh, by means different from um, traditional theoretical uh, methodologies. So, um, to introduce uh, that, that particular uh, approach that uh, has its roots in 
uh, quantitative structure property relationships of organic molecules. This is this pattern matrix that I've mentioned uh, and the property that's measured and the objective of the modeling is to calculate chemical descriptors from chem the knowledge of chemical structure and, um, and then through statistical model optimization uh, achieve a model that shows high accuracy which is uh, represented by a simple plot of comparing actual and predicted value of the target property. I'm using an example from uh, drug modeling where the predicted property is uh, inhibitory activity um, of uh, enzyme inhibitors, but um, overall does not matter. We're really talking about building statistical models that could accurately reproduce uh, the experimental results uh, using uh, chemical characteristics, chemical features, chemical descriptors of the, of the underlying compounds. And uh, one aspect that, uh, and I'll come back to this aspect uh, in the end of the talk, uh, to recognize is that, um, um, and that, that sort of that has been a, um, an element that was initially omitted uh, or not given enough attention by, uh, by computational modelers um, in chem informatics is that um, the modeling, the chem informatics modeling and statistical um, data analytics is done on the data sets that are collected uh, from the literature from the experimental labs and it sort of uh, has been regarded as not our job to look into uh, the sources of the data. We have the data, we have statistical tools, we build models, uh, we use models to forecast and help with experimental design and uh, that basically concludes the cycle of molecular modeling. And uh, what our group had realized and um, many others is that uh, increasingly we have to start paying attention to where we get the data and what's the origin of the data and increasingly uh, start looking into um, methods and tools for data collection and data organization and data curation and one of the practical reasons behind this is that as we have observed uh, in multiple cases when we would be unable to complete a successful modeling cycle and generate models with high accuracy we realized that uh, it was not only inefficiency or insufficiency of computational approaches, which sometimes is the case, but uh, uh, primarily uh, low accuracy of the input data uh, or low relevance of the input data or structural characteristics to the measured property. And so it, it's, it's important for uh, people, uh, especially who enter the field of computational data modeling to be fully aware of what I call here a data cycle, which is that uh, for every data point that's been analyzed uh, and modeled statistically, there is a source of this data. And uh, this is uh, a few boxes on the left uh, show the current uh, conventional sources of data uh, that uh, can be collected, structured, and then and, and, uh, put into models. And that includes uh, data that can be mined from literature, and uh, people are um, increasingly building um, natural language processing-based uh, tools for mining data from the literature, laboratory collections, electronic databases. I've mentioned some of them in the beginning, and perhaps less relevant to material design, but relevant to some other areas of statistical modeling, analysis of unstructured te texts that are um, coming from uh, uh, sources as uh, sort of traditionally considered non-scientifically relevant as Facebook or Twitter or other social media. And so uh, in the context of data science as a discipline, uh, the primary data sources need to be identified, the data of relevance to the task need to be collected initially in what's called data lake, and then structured based on field-specific ontology uh, that then enables uh, uh, the analysis of the structured database by computational models. And I just wanted to emphasize how important it is for um, modelers to fully understand the sources of the data, the uh, liabilities associated with the data. Um, for instance, uh, the measured property often depends not only on the structure of the compound, that um, that we have available, 
but also experimental conditions under which the target property has been measured. And so uh, if you're mindful of the sources of the data and if you're looking at experimental conditions, you may realize that you need to modify uh, and adjust modeling procedures and, and uh, start using not only structural descriptors of the compounds you're interested in, but also experimental conditions as additional descriptors. And so all of this is, uh, is critically important in order to achieve the uh, statistical accuracy uh, of models. So to this point, um, I want to share um, from the experience we've accumulated in chem informatics, um, what happens if, uh, if people are not uh, paying attention to um, data quality. Um, and, and that, uh, I always find this topic highly educational, um, for, um, especially for, for um, statisticians or computer scientists who um, enter the field of practical chem informatics or materials informatics uh, coming from, from um, that background and uh, not necessarily paying attention to the intricacies of experimental data. But um, um, this, this whole issue of data accuracy and data reproducibility that, that has become uh, widely discussed in the past years uh, for our lab started by uh, reading this paper that uh, almost 10 years ago now uh, talked about how unreliable data on biological activity of chemicals are and how oftentimes industrial scientists cannot reproduce claims made in the published literature on uh, what the function of a particular protein is. And um, ironically, uh, the same week um, that this paper on biological uh, targets was published, uh, another uh, paper was published by, by my colleagues, Tony Williams and Sean Ickens, uh, stating very loudly that uh, chemical structural information uh, deposited in multiple databases is oftentimes uh, erroneous. Uh, chemical structure is erroneously represented that leads to errors in descriptive calculations and inability to produce reliable models. And um, to complement this, sorry, so we talk about um, accuracy of biological data that's not high, uh, accuracy of chemical data representation. And then um, another group investigated uh, the effect that inaccurate representation of chemical structures has on the accuracy of models. Uh, because we could talk, uh, just in a very pu uh, purest sense, the data should be accurate, but this particular paper examined uh, the uh, outcome of an accurate representation of chemical structures and uh, modeling accuracy. And what they've concluded and shared in their paper is that uh, even if a small fraction of chemical data is inaccurate, it has profound effect on the quality of the models. And so that all amounts to the strong need to um, pay very close attention to uh, data curation uh, before you really start uh, using the most sophisticated um, data analytical methods. Um, I'll skip a few of um, um, additional slides that, that talk about the importance of dealing with the irreproducibility, because that's what really we're talking about. An accurate representation of data leads to irreproducibility of data in models and just illustrate what it means uh, for chemical structures. So here's an example of real chemical structures from uh, one of the databases we use historically. And uh, you have uh, multiple instances of uh, errors that are obvious to human eye, but if you process uh, large data sets, there is no way you could examine in, uh, visually any chemical structure. So uh, for chemists in the audience, uh, here's an example of a molecule that for some bizarre reason has a carbon uh, uh, that's penta balanced. Um, here is an example of uh, uh, a duplicate uh, chemical structure. So uh, that's very, very often uh, the case when um, the same object, same chemical, same materials have different names and are deposited in the data set. And um, uh, then uh, there are other aspects, presence of mixtures that are not labeled as mixtures, uh, presence of salts, that are not labeled as salts. So there are multiple uh, reasons as to why uh, training set compounds could be inaccurately represented. And that uh, poorly affects the outcome of modeling. So um, uh, to the, um, we have realized the importance of uh, uh, the analysis of data accuracy uh, of data and, and uh, sort of certifying 
the accuracy of data before getting into models. So here are a few points to be made that we're at the mercy of data providers. And so predictive performance and models depend strongly on the input data. Uh, both uh, measured data and computed data may be inaccurate and need to be curated. And uh, therefore, we uh, made a conclusion that many models that are published in the literature without um, uh, describing and discussing what was done to curate the data before the models were published or before the models were produced uh, may be strongly inaccurate. Sometimes um, uh, models could be over-optimistic and sometimes uh, models uh, don't work because the data was not properly uh, curated. And so for chemical data sets, uh, my group has developed uh, protocols um, that uh, deal with uh, uh, both chemical curation as well as curation of the target properties they uh, described in, uh, in critical publications that I cite on the slide. Uh, I won't go into detail, but just to mention that there are uh, well-prescribed uh, best practices and protocols for data curation, and um, some of them are applicable to materials, not only to organic molecules, uh, but uh, some need to be developed specific to the field. But um, again, it's very important uh, before building any models to uh, closely work with the data and um, um, isolate possible errors and uh, deal with those. Um, this is just one example uh, um, that, that's subtle uh, but important. So if you look at the top of the slide, uh, there are five different representations of uh, nitrobenzene and uh, all five are accurate. That's what makes this case subtle. All five representations are accurate. Uh, however, as you could see, uh, the technical representation of the nitro group is different and that leads to different values of chemical descriptors that characterize these molecules. And as a result, uh, without uh, normalizing the representation of the nitro group as shown here, uh, the model is poor for one of the cases of the target properties and um, it grows uh, up pretty dramatically and pretty much the same happens in another case study. So uh, it's, it's again, it's an illustration of how data curation um, at, at, at high level, addressing even subtle issues that are not necessarily obvious uh, right away, um, uh, need to be addressed before, uh, before people pr proceed with model building. Um, and another aspect that's very important and not often emphasized is that um, at the onset of a modeling investigation, we have a data set and we don't have um, an external set. The whole objective of the model development is to build a model and use it prospectively. And that creates um, an uh, intrinsic conflict between the approach that we take to build model, which is interpolate uh, between experimental data, and the utility of the model, which by default is extrapolation. And so this, this, this disconnect between interpolation and extrapolation uh, leads oftentimes to uh, statistically significant but nevertheless have little predictive power because of, of the effect of so-called overfitting. And so realizing this, this, this importance, uh, the importance of testing for overfitting um, um, has been critical for the field of statistical modeling of chemical substances. And uh, um, this paper that, that, that I cite below had integrated uh, what we've called best practices for QSAR, QSPR model development that includes uh, uh, an attention paid to uh, statistical validation. And what we typically do is uh, uh, use a fraction of the data and pretend that, we, uh, uh, that, that this fraction is completely unknown at the onset. Uh, it's, it's critical not to use the so-called external set in any way, even uh, to select models or, or um, uh, adjust weights of variables. Um, used in the model. So it's, it's absolutely critical to set aside an external set and never touch it until the, the step of what we call model evaluation, not even validation, um, such that the model uh, built uh, with various protocols uh, is, is evaluated on the external set uh, as closely as possible replicating the real life situation when model development and model validation are temporarily um, separated. 
So um, I just wanted to, to address this issue as well, because again, it's very critical, the protocol of statistical modeling and the attention paid to training set versus test set selection and model validation uh, is, is, is critical to address um, as we progress with, with model development. Um, and so, and then um, my final uh, methodological slide is uh, um, to emphasize what we do with models and what, what, uh, what the models are good for. Uh, in in uh, Kevin Vratik's field, a lot of um, argument has been spelled and a lot of uh, effort went into what the models are good for. And uh, what I emphasize on this slide is that we could interpret models, we could attempt to interpret multivariate models and look for um, specific functional chemical groups uh, that are more important than others, etc. cetera. And um, this exercise is a useful, but not necessarily justified by the nature of multivariate modeling. But uh, what the models are particularly good for, if they're well developed and properly applied, is for a process known as virtual screening, which is that once the models have been built, um, we employ them to mine existing databases of un tested compounds and use models to separate um, in this virtual screening exercise, separate this external data into uh, compounds predicted to have the desired property uh, or predicted to have undesired property and um, then offer the selections to experimental colleagues. And it's important to, to test uh, models for the ability to predict both um, active for both desired and undesired compounds and test those as well uh, because um, uh, the models really have to in the context of balanced accuracy accurately predicting both uh, true positives and true negatives and so that's that's that what this slide emphasizes to the model utility so um, speaking of uh, um, uh, materials informatics uh, it has been important uh, for us as, as we start talking about uh, um, uh, employing uh, these principles that I've just described to the analysis of uh, uh, material structure is to figure out how to uh, represent the materials. And so um, uh, in our initial uh, first publication uh, in, in the field of material science that was published uh, back five years ago, uh, the critical contribution of uh, that study was to figure out how to uh, transform the um, traditional representation of um, energy diagram uh, for uh, materials such as uh, inorganic oxides uh, and this di diagram. What comes out of um, um, conventional DFT level calculations of um, the structure of these materials in the form of electronic band diagram on the right to uh, um, transforming this to uh, uh, molecular fingerprints where essentially uh, for each material, each of these band diagrams is transformed, which we describe uh, carefully in the, in the paper, so I won't go into any detail transform this band diagrams into band structure fingerprints where different levels of those diagrams are represented by um, um, uh, energy um, uh, levels and by um, um, numerical uh, groups. And so uh, this transformation then allows us to represent each material by its fingerprint, uh, which is a very standard, this, this, this whole concept is completely borrowed from uh, chem informatics concept. And again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the transformation of the data into um, descriptors, so diagrams into descriptor profiles, enables uh, then the machinery accumulated uh, uh, for decades in chem informatics to be used to compare compounds. So uh, this uh, block uh, shows how uh, a, a single material or how multiple materials could be compared by their fingerprints and how by using what's known in similarity search as a probe. Uh, this is a, a profile of the probe. Uh, is compared to profiles of materials in the, in the database. So that's the virtual screening exercise to identify materials that are most similar 
to the probe and then um, uh, if the probe has the desired properties one could hypothesize that these materials can be um, uh, tested for the desired properties right so that's sort of the end of this workflow it starts by uh, taking bent structure and uh, the knowledge of properties generating this uh, uh, translating bent diagrams into uh, descriptive profiles of the band diagrams and then uh, doing virtual screening of uh, existing uh, materials uh, in uh, the database uh, called FLOLIP, database of structure and property of inorganic materials to identify new materials with the desired property. Um, the um, initial exercise, just to illustrate what uh, can be done with this representation, um, was what we've called materials map, or materials cartogram, and uh, so for um, 20,000 of materials, uh, each of them is represented by a point in the uh, high dimensional descriptor space mapped onto two dimensional um, space. Each material in this property, in this uh, database has been represented by fingerprints and then clustered by the fingerprint similarity. And so that uh, the, this picture that you see on the screen is the first representation, massive representation of a large uh, materials database in the space of uh, what we called uh, B fingerprint, which is uh, band diagram based fingerprints. And uh, what was interesting to observe is that um, um, this is not a homogeneous uh, distribution of points. Uh, the colors represent the value of band gap, um, which is a, a, an empirical characterization of a material electronic properties and uh, when we look at uh, when we've looked at the clusters of materials uh, our clusters are based on the similarity of the uh, uh, electronic fingerprints we've identified a few clusters and uh, looking deeper into those clusters we, we could identify several families of uh, um, known uh, materials with different types of properties such as a uh, cluster of metallic compounds, a uh, cluster of bimetals and polymetals, clusters of compounds with small BAP, there were some orphan compounds, and then the biggest was the, the cluster of uh, insulators, ceramics and complex oxides. So that sort of indicated to us that this representation and the use of cheminformatics-like methods to look at material similarity um, uh, has certain power uh, as applied to material science and uh, then we have progressed with additional uh, approaches to generating uh, materials fingerprints, uh, simpler methods. So um, that, that paper in 2017 looked at uh, taking a crystal structure and uh, generating descriptors directly from the crystal structure, uh, sort of similar to so-called fragment descriptors in chem informatics, uh, uh, not using any electronic structure information, just purely uh, structural characterization and what we have uh, shown is that uh, using a workflow um, that was similar to the traditional QSPR workflow used in chem informatics for small organic molecules, um, we have uh, been able to calculate those descriptors, we've called them universal fragment descriptors, and then uh, develop models uh, machine learning models to predict experimental properties known for these compounds, including electronic and thermomechanical properties uh, listed here, bulk modules, shear modules, heat capacity, etc., uh, with um, the accuracy um, that uh, um, was basically 90-95% uh, depending on the property and the um, uh, types of materials that we've used. And so um, that, that paper was one of the first where uh, machine learning methods have been used uh, to characterize uh, materials by simple descriptors of their composition and structure um, uh, based on uh, X-ray crystallography, crystallographic information and prediction of uh, a number of properties. And those models can be used and have been used to forecast the properties of uh, untested materials. So, uh, and, and the uh, results are shown here for um, uh, summative results for um, uh, multiple properties that um, uh, we've managed to collect. And then, um, as you could see, the uh, mean absolute error for each of those properties was uh, low and uh, correlation coefficient in this external validation experiments 
that I described. So in all cases, we are producing um, uh, and reporting accuracy for external validation has been 0.9 or higher. So these types of approaches are applicable to generating high quality models uh, to predict various properties of materials. So to summarize, um, we are talking about uh, fast and accurate uh, methods uh, for machine learning, uh, universal applicability to uh, different types of materials, covering different types of uh, elements in these materials, uh, different properties, uh, some insight, I don't have time to talk about getting insight, um, rules for materials design, and then uh, there are applications uh, that we have shared that allow one to take a, a new material and predict its uh, property from a pre-built um, models. Um, very quickly, uh, one experimental example of how uh, these types of approaches can be used um, uh, in this case with uh, an experimental collaborator at UNC, uh, a laboratory of Jim Cahoon, uh, who's been interested in disensitized solar cells and uh, um, using these types of models, uh, we had um, uh, been able uh, to uh, come up with a um, uh, new predicted material, uh, the best uh, material known to date was uh, uh, nickel oxide and um, uh, we have uh, built um, models using uh, historical data uh, to calculate uh, electronic property of uh, various uh, oxides um, in, uh, uh, in FLOLIP database and through the process of uh, B fingerprint calculations and then similarity assessment uh, and uh, virtual screening of flow lip uh, with using nickel oxide as a reference material, uh, we have uh, uh, come up with lead titanite as the lead unexpected uh, material to be used for uh, disensitized solar cell design uh, and that has been experimentally uh, tested in Jim's lab um, and uh, the paper describing this whole study uh, has been pub was published in, in 2016. This quickly shows uh, the protocol that we've used to come up with uh, this design and, uh, um, and then um, uh, it was uh, identified experimentally as a new photocathode material. So um, I've used this, this examples to demonstrate sort of and talk about the foundational theory behind materials informatics. Um, they are major elements um, predominantly borrowed from the field of chem informatics and uh, quantitative structure property relation of modeling of organic molecules, um, and then instances of model development and experimental design. And in the last section of the talk, I want to uh, briefly uh, cover uh, methods that are emerging in chem informatics for de novo design of compounds. And then, um, uh, you know, my, my expectation is that similar approaches uh, will begin to uh, proliferate in uh, material science. And so, um, um, just to, to introduce this last section of, uh, of the presentation, uh, the uh, studies that I've described so far and the methods that I described so far uh, can be summarized in this uh, workflow diagram when we uh, take data characterizing a particular specific data set, uh, uh, disensitized solar uh, cells, for instance, uh, certain properties of materials used in this design um, or um, any physical property. It's one particular property and a, a data set of compounds for which this property is measured. We develop models specific to this property and then we conduct virtual screen of an existing data set to select and test known molecules. So my previous example of uh, choosing lead titanite uh, as a hit uh, is a perfect example of, of uh, this particular routine. And I emphasize that we've uh, found an existing material and tested it and uh, proved um, to have the desired properties, but um, um, we are limited in this type of workflow by compounds that have been synthesized and characterized prior to our computational exploration. And uh, methods that are beginning to emerge uh, is uh, um, uh, more general approaches that can take uh, and learn general knowledge about um, chemical structure, composition of uh, diverse compounds that uh, uh, have been tested for uh, certain global properties. So the example I'm showing here 
is that uh, uh, we, we've analyzed uh, a database of all compounds that have been tested for various types of biological activities and consolidated in a database uh, broad applicability, not focusing on any specific type of biological activity, but a broad database of all bioactive compounds. And the task that we've embarked upon is to learn general rules of how these compounds are built. What are the principles by which one could generate a molecule that may have any type of biological activity? And so these types of questions are asked with modern um, AI methods. And uh, the, um, the approach that we've called uh, release, reinforcement learning for structure evolution, uh, we've learned the principles of building chemical structures that uh, enabled us to uh, come up with a protocol that could generate novel realistic model molecules. And, um, uh, and that, 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 that's nice, that gives us compounds that can be realistic synthesizable chemicals. But uh, in our interest to come up with new compounds that have the desired property, we've added another um, uh, loop um, and another protocol uh, called reinforcement learning that uh, could take newly generated compounds and ask a simple question, is this compound of any value to a property of interest? And uh, basically by answering this question, inform the generator uh, as to whether or not uh, the, it produces molecules that we want, or molecules that are synthetically feasible, but uh, are not predicted to have the desired property. And so that entire protocol that we've called release, uh, what it produces in the end is uh, new computational hits, new compounds with new structure that have the desired property. And that um, moves this whole methodology into the realms of de novo structure generation, as opposed to uh, selection from the existing chemical matter. So uh, to briefly discuss what, what, what was behind it, which, uh, and, and it was a very, very interesting um, overall study, uh, what enabled is, uh, the study is uh, um, uh, the learning and uh, adopting a methodology that has been used in a different field of natural language processing. And uh, what we have accomplished here is that we've used and looked at how chemical structures have been traditionally represented in chemical databases. And of course, they are represented by their names, uh, by chemical graph uh, drawings. But most importantly, uh, a scientist, uh, one of the uh, major contributors to cheminformatics named Dave Weininger, uh, passed away several years ago, unfortunately, um, had developed a uh, data archiving, chemical data archiving um, approach that he called SMILES, uh, Simplified Molecular Input Line Entry System. And uh, that is effectively a collection of characters uh, that um, um, form a, a line notation. It's a, it's a string of characters and the string of characters encodes uh, the complexity of the chemical structure. And has been used for archiving molecules because it's as you could see, a much more compact way of representing the chemical structure than an image and uh, occupies, of course, um, much smaller space. And so uh, this diagram basically shows how different elements of chemical structure are encoded in, uh, in the simple line notation. But um, what one may realize looking at this is that this uh, uh, sequence of characters is essentially what we have in, uh, in sentences. Um, that we use to uh, talk to each other or communicate information. And so uh, that begs the question if natural language processing approaches that uh, are used to um, predict uh, the meaning, for instance, the meaning of the word in the context of a sentence uh, could be used uh, in order to predict which character should occur in uh, a sequence that collectively represents a realistic um, chemical structure. And so we've effectively borrowed um, these types of approaches from uh, natural language processing and applied these approaches to a textual representation of chemical structure in the form of uh, SMILES. And so um, uh, overall, uh, this is a protocol at a little bit higher level of detail where um, uh, we um, learn uh, the rules 
of assembly a meaningful molecular structure uh, from characters used in uh, SMILES notation, uh, and then teach the model to generate uh, realistic um, SMILES, and then uh, evaluate the SMILES by a predictive model, so that's the um, uh, reinforcement learning component, and then inform the generator uh, reward it if the molecule has the desired property or, or punish it if, if it doesn't. And so that um, combination of a generative model and a predictive model that biases the generator is the core of, of this approach and uh, this and similar approaches have been uh, very actively investigated in the de novo design uh, chemical, uh, de novo chemical design community. Um, this are, um, I imagine the slides will be shared, this is a summary for those who are interested of different types of artificial intelligence approaches that have been published and used um, in de novo chemical structure generation. Uh, um, they are ongoing, uh, parallel, uh, not necessarily competing approaches uh, with their uh, advantages or disadvantages and uh, they have been actively investigated by AI and chemistry uh, community. Uh, again, this is a summary of uh, uh, the studies and uh, um, the types of models and the types of biasing that is used. Uh, I'll probably skip, in the interest of time, uh, um, how this methodology works since it's been published. Uh, this is just to uh, show that uh, it's a methodology that gradually converges to a small error as we continue to generate new smiles. We look at how similar they are uh, to the historically known smiles, and that's an error function that's been trained um, uh, and, and minimized in the process of training. Uh, one critical question that uh, we've addressed methodologically is whether once the system is built, whether it generates realistic chemical uh, structures. So we've used an external um, software uh, from a company, ChemAxon, that uh, simply evaluates all compounds produced by the system whether uh, as to whether they're chemically feasible or not. So we've achieved an accuracy of 95% in the output of the generator. So 95% uh, of molecules that we generate are uh, chemically realistic. Um, this is an essence of building descriptors, of uh, building models that are used in reinforcement models. So um, we um, are using uh, SMILES representations. We've achieved uh, accuracy typical for a standard Q uh, SPR uh, modeling exercise. Um, and uh, this is a brief illustration as to how this works. Produces a model uh, that goes into predictive model. Uh, if it's um, active, if it's predicted uh, uh, to have the desired property, then the generative model gets a reward. And if it's predicted to um, be inactive molecule in this case, then the generative model uh, gets a punishment, uh, so to speak. And so this balance between reward and punishment uh, progressively moves the generative model to compounds that uh, uh, have the desired property. And so uh, this is some technical issues as to how long it, uh, it takes. Um, this is to um, show that the mo molecules that the system produce, uh, produces um, have synthetic accessibility similar to that of molecules used in the training sets. Uh, these are just examples of how the system works. You could bias it to compounds of increased complexity or decreased complexity, so the biases can be, various biases can be incorporated and uh, move the generator to um, various de desired structural or physical properties, um, uh, such as uh, here, the melting temperature. We've pushed the model to produce compounds predicted to have either low melting temperature or high melting temperature. Um, uh, and um, uh, this is uh, one recent example of um, um, developing a, a model and predicting uh, compounds uh, to be inhibitors of a particular enzyme. And uh, in the end, we, we've demonstrated here that uh, we have uh, uh, generated compounds experimentally tested to um, have uh, the desired uh, enzymatic activity just to show that uh, it's important to um, um, test models in the end, not only by their theoretical robustness, but the ability to make accurate predictions testable in the experimental labs. Um, so um, I'll finish with a few um, comments that uh, um, um, kind of go back to the importance of uh, 
careful approach to model development, uh, honest approach to model development, and a realistic assessment of uh, what you produce uh, when you develop a models. And so uh, uh, there is, as uh, many of you know, there is an enormous level of hype associated with uh, uh, advanced machine learning approaches such as deep uh, neural nets. Uh, and uh, we need to basically maintain sanity in evaluating the results of these models. And so to this point, um, here is just one example that I want to um, use to illustrate uh, this, my appeal to be careful as we um, claim superiority of new approaches. Uh, this is a study uh, that uh, concluded that deep learning methods significantly outperform all competing methods, but if you look more closely at the results of uh, statistics for deep learning approach versus standard support vector machines or random forest, um, the advantage is at the level of 0 0.04 at best um, um, accuracy improvement. Uh, and that's at the same time as statistical error is an order of magnitude larger. So uh, basically, uh, this algorithms uh, as applied to structure property relationship modeling show promise, um, but um, are yet to show superiority. And, uh, you know, as we examine new methods, uh, I always appeal to, to people to uh, be realistic and objective as, uh, as they evaluate um, uh, what they learn. And just to make this point and then print it, imprint it in your, into your minds, uh, um, people use this uh, and are fascinated with AI and uh, sometimes, um, 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 it's, it's, it's important to look at uh, other aspects. So uh, um, one of the computer scientists at the Rice University speaking at the AAAS meeting a year ago had made points, uh, and a major point is here, machine learning causing science crisis. And that is that uh, uh, um, we built models that are, that whose intention is to optimize. You have a lot of data and you have powerful algorithms, you will achieve uh, um, the optimization result. Um, because machine learning algorithms have been developed specifically to find interesting things in data sets. But I always find something. And so um, um, uh, the fact that you cannot validate uh, these models uh, because they're complex and take long time to develop, uh, essentially uh, goes back to the point I made earlier that if it's not validated externally, then it has, been, been val has not been validated and may not necessarily be reliable uh, to be used. And so we really need to be very careful with evaluating the output of the most modern methods um, as we compare uh, um, or expect them to be accurate. So uh, 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 people talk about AI, people uh, force AI, uh, and uh, sometimes it's known in uh, social scientists as the rule of three. That is that if you want uh, your kids to hear you, you say the same uh, or give the same order three times, thinking that uh, three times is enough for them to hear, so there is this rule of three. Uh, if you say AI three times, uh, and I hope to be heard, uh, that uh, what, what you are saying is, is uh, true and accurate. If you say it three times and ask what AI, AI, AI means, uh, in the urban dictionary, there is this definition that is a phrase used by most evil people with bad intentions. Not that I am saying that AI scientists have bad intentions, not at all, but uh, this is just, um, again, to emphasize the point I've been making earlier that we have to be careful when we evaluate the results. And so to finish off, um, uh, the really um, true uh, validation of any statistical model is in the experimental lab. And so uh, we certainly emphasize this. This is uh, just one result that uh, of the ongoing studies into molecular design tasted experimentally uh, where certain level of success has been achieved with Genova design molecules. And that again, something I would encourage everybody developing models to collaborate extensively with experimental scientists and um, um, use uh, uh, or test Genova design uh, compounds and materials um, to claim uh, some victory of computational approaches. Um, uh, there are more um, examples emerging on uh, experimental confirmation of models uh, from, from various labs. So that's uh, um, and, and great demonstration that, that things uh, uh, actually work. 
Uh, another recent development uh, that I wanted to touch uh, quickly uh, is automation. Um, once we build algorithms that uh, do de novo molecular synthesis, uh, coupling them with experimental automated systems of chemical synthesis is, is a very um, attractive approach. And so this really wonderful review that Alan Asperguzik uh, put out uh, last year um, explaining how self-driving laboratories uh, um, should work and, and facilitate the work of organic chemists is a really interesting and important approach that uh, should be developed in the synthesis of both organic and uh, inorganic materials. So uh, this is my overall summary. Um, we are talking about the use of machine learning uh, for big data analytics in chemistry and material science. Uh, the opportunities are uh, tremendous, uh, but I emphasize that especially in big data algorithms, primary data must be handled with extreme care. So uh, curation and validation is very important. Um, it's critical to validate models using truly external data, ideally in a blind experiment. And uh, as, as to the uh, ongoing trends in chemical and material science, uh, we should see uh, increasing and exciting shift from uh, data past data modeling and virtual screening separated from uh, experimental confirmation to an integrated integrated systems where methods drive the design and robotic synthesis uh, uh, through specialized platforms. So uh, with that, I will um, uh, finish. Um, um, last optimistic comment, uh, and I borrow this from uh, Derek Lau, um, a blogger, a uh, famous blogger in um, chem informatics and drug discovery and uh, science in general. Um, from multiple optimistic comments about the use of AI, rise of smartest machines, when it's a chemists, humans need not apply. So a lot of people worry about uh, whether experimental scientists are going to have jobs in the near future. And to that point, uh, Derek said it's not the machines are going to replace chemists, is that the chemists who use machines will replace those that don't. Um, and uh, we're basically talking about methodologies that every practicing chemist need to start acquiring and, and use um, uh, in their work. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, I acknowledge contributions from uh, various associates and uh, my lab and, uh, and collaborators elsewhere um, funding and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you Alexander for the nice talk. So we will have uh, a few minutes for questions. So for the audience, please uh, try to post your question in the question tab so, I, so that I can help read out the questions or I can un unmute you for you to ask questions directly. Uh, so actually, I, I'll, I'll ask the first question. So Alexander, you mentioned about the choice of different methods. So can mm -hmm. you give us some insights about the performance of the different models and uh, also spe specifically how uh, they will depend on the data, training data size? So for example, if I have only a few thousand a few thousand training samples. Should I bother, even bother, try to go to use deep learning, or I can start with some So action? yes. So thank you. That that's a good question. So there are no rules um, for data modelers. The more the merrier. Uh, uh, certainly, extrapolation on one or two data points uh, is uh, laughable. Although I have seen uh, these types of exercises uh, published. Um, so um, we. When we build models, our major criteria is whether we could set aside a, uh, an external data set of appreciable size such that um, change in one point, designation in this data set, uh, is not expected to have dramatic effect. So just for example, right, if you have a, an external set of 10 compounds, if one is mispredicted, that's 10%. So that's, that's really uh, a very high level of uncertainty. Um, so, uh, as a rule of thumb, if you will, we're trying to uh, deal with data sets that uh, have, uh, you know, 60, 80 to 100, at the very uh, least, uh, instances. Uh, thousands of, uh, 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 thousands or hundreds of thousands of millions that when uh, computations have become extensive, but um, speaking of the lower level uh, threshold, um, I would stick with, with something around, you know, 80 to 100. 
uh, data points. As far as different algorithms, um, the experience in chem informatics is that uh, descriptors uh, have much stronger effect uh, than algorithms. Uh, and uh, in everything that I've observed, that continues to be true. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have uh, one more questions. Uh, so I'll try to unmute the person so that he can ask the question directly. Uh, hi, Weiji. Oh, hi. Oh, yes. <coughs> I have a question related to the uh, transition transition metal oxide mentioned in the talk. Uh, if I remember correctly, some uh, transition metal oxide, uh, they have a like, strong electron correlation effect. And as far as I know, if uh, such effect is not taken care of, um, I mean, like for, for example, in nickel oxide, a traditional mm -hmm. DFT probably predict that material as a metal. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you use a DFT plus U, then a bank gap would be shown. I was wondering if uh, such uh, electron correlation effect uh, is uh, being, being treated carefully in the uh, DFT sure. database. So, 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 so excellent, excellent, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's all my question. I, I, I just wondering if uh, such effect is uh, treated sure carefully in the DFT database. Thank you. So, right. So, uh, so it's a good question because I think that they allow me to highlight. Uh, I hear an echo, so maybe you um, mute your microphone. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so here is the thing that's important to realize. Um, uh, models that I've described um, are not extrapolating beyond the uh, content of the data we're trying to model. So um, unlike uh, DFT per se, that has an, um, an appearance and appeal of um, true ab initio methodology, uh, the, um, the power of the models in, the, in forecasting what has been measured and the accuracy of prediction uh, cannot exceed the accuracy of, of the property that you're trying to model. So if DFT is unable to take this effect into account and we're reproducing DFT calculations, we will reproduce DFT, but we will not catch the effect. This is not within the power of the model. Um, the best answer I could give you is that if the prediction is inaccurate, the analysis of the sources of inaccuracy could point you um, to uh, insufficiency of, of structure representation. But it's not really something that, um, it's not the question to uh, statistical modelers, it's the question to people who conduct DFT. We do not run, what I described is not um, our DFT calculations. We're users, right? We're the mercy of the developers. So we're users of the Aflow database of, uh, if, if, uh, which, which, which has been computed at the DFT level. Right, so if this effect is not captured in the database, uh, statistical models would not uh, bring it up. Okay, thank you, Alexander. So we will uh, move to our next talk, and uh, for the audience, so this video will be recorded and uh, uploaded onto our uh, uh, APS GDS channel. So please search APS GDS on YouTube, so you can see the video recorded. Okay, so we will continue uh, with our second talk by. Uh, Jason, so Jason, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. I change you to the presenter. Okay, okay. Now you all see our host and previous presenter. And you can. Okay, great. So, uh, Dr. Jason Hedrick oh, seems. Yeah. Uh, is it a problem or? No, no, I, I'm sorry. I'm trying okay, to get so, my slides to show. So Jason is a materials uh, research engineer in the materials and uh, manufacturing for sustainable development group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. 
So uh, Jason got his PhD in material science and en en uh, engineering at the University of Maryland. And prior to joining NIST, he was an assistant professor of chemical engineering at the University of South Carolina in the uh, Smart State uh, Center for the strategic approaches to the generation of electricity. So uh, today, uh, Jason will talk about machine learning in materials discovery, and especially he will give a more hands-on uh, tutorial using Google uh, Colab. Okay, so Jason, you can start. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, thanks. Thanks for everybody for joining. Um, if you could, please, if you're interested in following along, take this moment, open the collapse folder, and run the first two cells. Uh, it's important that we make sure that all the modules are present in the Google Drive. Uh, so the way that this is going to progress is very similar to a class, right? So we're going to start out with some introductory material, I'm going to describe, you know, sort of our general view on how AI plays a role in materials discovery, and then move pretty quickly into a particular materials field of interest, talk about the properties that are interesting and that might be difficult to compute even using uh, high throughput density functional theory calculations, and then sort of move into the grist of where we're going to get the data. I'm an experimentalist by training, and so most of the models that we build are built off of actual like experimental databases, which are dirty, rife with errors. And so we're going to have to walk through cleaning the data and how we approach it, what are the materials we're interested in, the realization that physics change even in a particular targeted study. And so making sure that you're identifying material systems and materials training data that are relevant. And then what are we going to use to build the model? So I want to start out by saying that this is a module that was actually developed uh, for Gilad Kuzni, Chiro Takeuchi, Alex Belyanov, and Dan Samarov's Machine Learning for Materials Research Bootcamp. Uh, that's interesting. I assume that this is, I just realized they had 2019 to 2020, but in any event, uh, this July they host it every year. It's about a week long uh, combination of boot camp and then sort of workshop in about three days of hands on techniques. And so this whole module, this whole lesson was built up in support of that um, with the help very largely of Brian DeCott. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think I need to motivate a bunch of people who are here at an AI for materials or physics uh, short course why it's interesting. Um, it's everywhere. It's omnipresent. Autonomous cars, instantaneous on-demand translation using your cell phone camera, Dota 2 being best players in the world being conquered by computers. Um, it's accessible. Any of us can sit down with Weka, Scikit-Learn, and take a Coursera or a Kaggle class and immediately begin to make AI models. And the data is more and more prevalent. Um, in materials research, particularly uh, computational data, you can take your pick, materials project, OKMG, AFLOLib. There are numerous sources for that. Um, question is what happens when they need to sort of file. Huh. Good question. Okay. Sorry. What happened? Um, in materials, experimental data sets are harder to come by. Um, and so when you can find them, particularly a well curated one, um, it, it's a gem. Um, so the sort of dream, right, is to take observational data, uh, databases, data sets, things hidden in text or somehow text mining using NLP, scientific papers, these sort of physiochemical theories that we know exist that rationalize our uh, view of the world, turn these into attributes, turn our data into training sets, train machine learning models, make rampant predictions through composition processing space, 
and then use something like high throughput experimentation to validate these models or to invalidate them. The sort of joy of working with machine learning models as an experimentalist as compared to theory is the AI really doesn't care if it's wrong. And in fact, if it was wrong and you tell it was wrong for a given data set or a given data point, all subsequent models are informed by that. And so the next set of predictions are made that much better. From these types of studies, you can discover new materials. And if you're lucky, even get towards understanding new knowledge or increasing our understanding of the physical world around us. Um, this was something that we did uh, with Slack and Northwestern a couple of years ago, where we sort of demonstrated the ability to increase by several orders of magnitude the rate at which one could discover new metallic glasses. Um, as an experimentalist, I like complex systems that are difficult to compute. Amorphous alloys are a good example of that, where you don't have regular translational and rotational symmetry. Right, you just got local order and long range disorder. Another version of this is uh, compositionally complex alloys, like high entropy alloys, something like a uh, solid solution of five to seven elements where any side of the lattice could be equally probabilistically occupied by atom A, B, C, D, E, or G, right? Um, another version of this that we're going to talk about in this lecture is hydrogen storage alloys, particularly the so-called ordered lava space type structures, AB5, AB, A2B, right, where instead of, it starts out as a nice ordered intermetallic structure, but then you can do site substitution. And so your A or your B site could be unbelievably disordered in terms of what elements are sitting on it. And so the computational problem gets to be very difficult and it's a little bit more convenient to turn to uh, machine learning. Um, we use this regularly in the lab. I have to say that I'm not only somebody who's an advocate of AI and machine learning, but I'm also a skeptic. I love this slide. When Google Arts and Culture is apt to compare your face to a painting, doesn't think that I'm a lady, this is the picture that comes up. Wonderful, it knows kind of similar, poorly shaven. Um, but the interesting thing to me was it figured out my last name just from a picture of me because my last name, Patrick, literally means cabinet maker. And that's baffling to me. Google just guessed my name. Not, right? We have to understand that these models are building in correlation. Right, causation or interpretation are our own method of rationalizing what comes out of the AI model. And we have to be careful in how we rationalize these and interpret the outputs of these models. And always look at them with a skeptical eye. I really enjoyed the fact that Alexander specifically highlighted the need to take a part of your data set out and never use it for cross-validation, never use it for model building, and just use it at the end for final validation of the model. I, that is something that we regularly practice. Um, from a material standpoint, look, there are a lot of materials that are desperate for, a lot of technologies that are desperate for new materials. Gas steam turbines, corrosion resistant alloys, additive manufacturing. Um, we're going to focus here on clean energy and in particular hydrogen storage and delivery. So since before I was born, hydrogen's been the fuel of the future. It's a wonderful energy carrier. Uh, they started exploring it for vehicular applications in the 70s. There are advantages. It's abundant. It produces energy cleanly. You burn hydrogen, you get water. You use it in a fuel cell, you get water. It has a huge gravimetric energy density way on the right side of this graph, higher than fuel, JP8, diesel, methane, methanol. This advantage is, is most of the time you're going to find it, it's already fully oxidized as water. It has a low volumetric energy density as compared to our normal sources of water, which means you need a big gas tank to be able to get as far, although it does also, if you use it in a fuel cell, it's much more efficient, and so that's the trade-off. 
There's also a lack of delivery infrastructure. There are no hydrogen, we say that, there are few hydrogen storage stations and there's not a distributed network as there are existing currently for petroleum-based fuels and as are being built up for batteries. Um, hydrogen is stored interestingly. The previous graph talked about liquid hydrogen and gas hydrogen compressed to multiple high pressures. Um, those are so-called physical based methods. There's also this material based method, whether it be on the surface or inside the pores of adsorbent, uh, bonded tightly to something like aluminum in a complex hydride, uh, as chemical hydrogen in something like ammonia borane, or my personal favorite is interstitial hydride, where you take something like lanthanum nickel five and you can stick six hydrogens in per unit cell. The advantage to this is if you sort of counterintuitively, right, if I take hydrogen as a gas and I stick it next to metals, I can actually get more hydrogen close to one another. In other words, increase the volumetric energy density while maintaining a reasonable graviometric density and actually have something that looks to be competitive with petroleum, particularly when you consider energy efficiency. And so that's interesting. Um, DOE loves these spider charts. I don't want to emphasize this too much, but on the right-hand side of this, right, a lot of these things, what just happened? Well, every time I move this, it drops down. On um, most of these things, you know, like, uh, sorry, gravimetric density can be calculated a priori, volumetric density. But the things that are really sort of interesting are on the right side of this graph, delivery temperature, delivery pressure, operating temperature. And those have, those are more difficult to calculate structures a priori. You actually have to you actually don't have a good method of doing so. Um, typically how they're measured is by taking something called a pressure composition isotherm, which means hold temperature constant, put your material in a sievert apparatus, put hydrogen pressure in, watch the pressure drop a little bit, put it in, put it, let it drop, put it in, little drop, and then inside of this plateau region in the center, that's where hydrogen is actually going into the interstitial sites of your material. And if you do this for a series of temperatures and take the center point of those curves, so-called plateau temperature, and plot them in a Van Hoff plot, from the slope of these lines, you can calculate the enthalpy of your hydrogen, of the formation of the hydride. That's really interesting, and it's been done for a number of years. Hydrogen storage alloys from the inorganic material standpoint are kind of ahead of their time. Um, this hydride database has been stood up since the early 2000s, if not the late 1990s. And what it is is an online database that you can interact with that contains a diverse met contains a menagerie of different types of materials and material storage methods, adsorption, interstitial, chemical hydrides, and so forth. And for a purely experimental data set, it's huge. It's nearly 3,000 total entries, um, which you can search based off of the material type, even down to the structure of the material, who made it, what are the sort of engineering constraints that you have for your application. Um, and again, these are the original high entropy alloys. Lanthanum nickel five is the base material of all nickel metal hydride, right? That's the starting material of nickel metal hydride. But when you consider something that's actually maybe in a battery, you're talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different elements present in different proportions, and you're actually off the lanthanum one stoichiometry. And so, from a computational standpoint, if one were to try to do DFT, this is quite difficult. Um, so what do we got? We're, we're going to build a model of the enthalpy of formation for hydrides. Uh, first thing we're going to do 
is we're going to extract experimental data. This was taken from a previous work where we were looking at metallic glasses, but same idea. You pull out experimental data from this hydride data set, you clean it, you regularize it, you create a set of composition-based representation. This is based off of Logan Ward's paper referenced in the bottom left. And then we're going to build a machine learning algorithm on top of that composition-based representation and use that to predict the enthalpy of formation across the broad spectrum of potential alloys. So quickly, what is a random forest, right? So if you consider a simple machine algorithm, machine learning algorithm, a decision tree, right? The parameter is, do I want to play outside? You take into account the outlook and you split over sunny overcast and rain. You take into account the humidity or if it's windy or not, and you trace down until you've either completely isolated things. So play and don't play are represented as zeros in one of the boxes or not. And this is a wonderful method for determining whether I'm going to go outside and play. It's a little bit more difficult in the materials properties. And so what one can do is one can take from our data set and from our set of parameters that we're training on a random subset of each, build a entire forest of these decision trees, right? And then sort of decide at the end how we're going to bring these trees back together to form a t overall forest, right? And so this has a much larger predictive power than an individual decision tree. Um, we've found in general that they can behave as well as like K nearest neighbors or a good lookup table. Okay, so let's get into the meat. So if we open up, up, so if we go to the collab now, I've asked you all to run the first two columns. We're not going to actually be saving data in this particular instance, so you don't have to worry about writing files. Um, the code's there. It's free. Take it. Do with it what you will. Build better models, write papers refuting our original paper. All of it's fair play. So. This, that's really annoying. Okay, there we go. So we run the first thing to install import sys and pips. Shouldn't take long. And then we're going to import the packages. We're going to use glob, numpy, pandas for dealing with data frame. Audience view went down to zero. Lost everybody. Uh, Matt Miner and a bunch of things from SK Learn, including linear model, pre-processing metrics, and model selection. Also import the drive that you're working on. All right. So now that we have all of the things that we need to start with, first thing we do is we load the data. Again, emphasizing you have to believe a machine learning prediction. You absolutely have to have a holdout set. And so in this case, a bunch of friends from Savannah River National Lab combed through the literature for me and came up with a set of uh, intermetallic interstitial hydride that they thought were a sufficiently representative holdout set. Uh, what you can see again is, first of all, the enthalpy of formations are relatively low uh, for the particular application they had in mind. This is ideal, and the chemical representation of them is pretty complex. All right, so then we take the full DOE data set and print out the header.
All right. I have to do with that thing all the way down to the bottom. All right, so what we can see starting from the top is the first two rows are going to be problematic for the machine learning algorithm because they have, they're supposed to represent the compositional variation of nickel and beryllium in this particular alloy, which give rise to a heat of formation that spans from 71 to 80 kilojoules per mole. And the range is given, but not necessarily the correlation of the 71 to 80 percent represent going from 0 0.15 to 0 0.25, or is it the reverse? Or is there a peak in between them? And so that's going to be problematic for us. We're going to have to get rid of that particular set of data in the data cleaning part. And actually, we're going to have to get rid of a lot of things because the physics of hydrogen storage materials change whether it's bound to something like boron as in lithium boron hydrogen or if it's like a lane where it's directly chemically bonded to aluminum versus an interstitial hydride versus an absorbent material that only absorbs hydrogen through weak adsorption physioabsorption properties at very low temperatures and so going into the process of determining what material, how to build a model to predict new interstitial hydrides, the first thing you have to do is strip out from the data set anything that has different physics associated with it, unless you have a good descriptor or a differentiator between the two, which to my mind at this point, we do not have. And so there are also things like magnesium was very popular, um, metallic hydride for a number of years. Um, not only were they the original high, uh, High entropy alloys, there was this use of mish metal, which is just cheap metal that you can get. It's a mixture of a bunch of things, transition metals and rare earths. It's sort of dirt cheap, and you can put it into a material and improve its metallic hydride, its uh, hydrogen storage properties, change the enthalpy, change the weight percent slightly, change kinetics. However, it's not very well defined. It's like coal in some senses. Where you got the mesh metal will impact its actual content. And so since it's not well defined, it's not quantified other than to say it's mesh metal inside of a lot of these formulations, they have to be thrown out. And so that's what this next block of code does. Um, it's going to get rid of anything that's got magnesium. It's going to get rid of anything that has mesh metal. Uh, it's going to get rid of oxides. Um, it's going to get rid of a couple of irregular terms inside of it. Look for parentheses and then clean up the composition string and remove rows, remove a number of rows where, you know, basically get out, get rid of magnesium, get rid of those things with variable composition and so forth. And we get to click on it once and it's done. This has to be hand curated typically and lovingly done. This is generally where most of your work goes. Okay, so we're still not done cleaning up the data. Uh, some of these materials are listed as average ranges. And so what do you do when a thing is reported as being an average, uh, being a range? Well, one can take the average of those ranges. Uh, in the import of the Excel data sheet from basically from the website to Excel to Pandas, at some point some of the compositions were identified as being dates and times. So strip those out and we've gone down from something in the order of 3,000 total compounds to a reasonable training size of about 400 compounds. All right, so we're gonna now use, we're gonna pull out the heat of formation from our data set and we're going to create a normalized composition for each of the samples because 
people report compositions in different ways. And so now we have a regularized version of composition for each and every alloy. Um, moreover, you'll notice that we also have a flag for composition over here. What this allows you to do is when you're doing your cross-validation, your training split, one of the nice ways of doing the training split, if you really want to check and see how strong the model you're building is, is you can group things based off of their composition and deliberately hold a composition group out of your training set or, and then only have it in validation or vice versa. So moving down to the next one, we're gonna do the same for our test data set. Notice again, we get this nice composition string that we're able to use subsequently. Okay, and so part of getting to know the data set, um, there's an issue of extrapolation versus interpolation and extrapolation versus interpolation works a couple of different ways. Firstly, it works in the n-dimensional space that you're interacting with your materials on. So if you've got five or six orthogonal dimensions that are like the composition vanadium, titanium, iron, and you're trying to look in a corner and there aren't any points around there, then you can legitimately be stated to be extrapolating. The other form of extrapolation versus interpolation, right, is in the actual property you're measuring. And so you want to look at the distribution of the properties you're measuring in your data set and see, am I asking for a room temperature superconductor, but all I have are type one superconductors? So this is the distribution of data that sits inside of our hydride data set, uh, heat of formation. There are a couple of extreme outliers, 400 kilojoules per mole hydrogen. Large portion of them reside somewhere between zero and 100 kilojoules per mole. And you know, for this particular project for interstitial hydride, we were largely interested in something that had a heat of formation somewhere between 20 and 30 kilojoules per mole, which is reasonably represented inside of the group. And so you're assured that you're probably not extrapolating too much. All right, so we've done that. Let's now take our data sets and let's actually make our features so that we can actually build a model on them. I don't want to go into too much detail. Magpie basically generates these 132 different representations, all chemistry. No structure is contained inside of here other than it knows the space group for each of the elements. But it gives you things like, you know, Mendeleev number, range, maximum, mean, mode, uh, atomic weight, melting temperature, what column you're in. Uh, covalent radii and so forth. Uh, hi, Jason. Sorry to interrupt. So, we think that we still sure, have sure. some pro problem accessing the IPython notebook file. So, we are trying to fix that. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe you can slow down a little bit. Uh, Actually, I think the easiest solution is for people to follow along with Jay. Um, I'm entering instructions in the um, chat window, and in a moment we'll have a shareable link, and then you'll be good to go. So just uh, follow Jay for now, and then look in periodically in the text window, and so you should be able to reproduce this later. Okay, thank yeah, you. Um, all of the codes available online. Um, obviously, the collab file is there for you. Um, as sort of an aside, in this sort of machine learning space, uh, reproducibility is everything because it's so difficult for people to internalize what's happening. Um, general best practice is to provide the data set that you worked with, the code that you use to analyze it and generate the figures uh, with the paper during at the time of publication, generally in like a GitHub repository. 
Okay, so carrying on. Uh, uh, yes, good. please uh, carry on, Jay. Um, as soon as we have a shareable link, we'll let you know. Otherwise, we'll just send you the zip file, uh, well, a link to a zip file, and then you can run that your own on your own in your own Google Drive. So don't worry, we're on it. Okay, thank you, William. Um, so, right, we have to also create the same representation for our holdout set because eventually we're going to want to test our model against them. Done. So, check your shape. What's the size, particularly of your test data set, to make sure that you haven't dropped anything? All right. Um, so, next step is to generate a statistical representation of what the model is going to see. And so, as we talked earlier, um, you want to do cross validation, but one of the things that you can control one for reproducibility in these models so that others can actually one to one reproduce your data, but then also to get a sense for how robust your model is against random permutations of the validation training split is to run your model some set of times, say uh, 50 overall times with a set validation size and then control the random speed. Uh, we generally just do it via the index. So here we're gonna do a uh, so-called tenfold cross-validation uh, where we're gonna keep duplicate compositions together. So basically if there's more than one entry inside of there for a given alloy, they're both in the training or they're both in the validation set. This is gonna impact our validation, calculation of validation error, but so be it. Uh, we're actually just building a random forest regressor. So random forest can be used for classification. Do I go outside? Do I not? Is it metallic glass? Is it not? But you can also use it to do regression, which basically hits the line locally to a leaf. And then we're going to make a set of predictions on that particular, using that model on our test set and our validation set. And then we're just going to try to keep track of those values so that later on we can do statistical analysis. So this doesn't take particularly long. One of the advantages also to using random forest with modest data sizes is training of the model only takes a couple of seconds. Okay, so we create a uh, data set. So that we can create a numpy array so that we can deal with it. And one of the first things that we can do is we can calculate the mean average error and the mean, I'm sorry, mean absolute error and the mean absolute percent error, right, from our test set. In this particular case, the mean absolute error is about four kilojoules per mole. Um, that can be somewhat deceptive because four kilojoules per mole doesn't seem very large when you had a span that went up to 100 or 150 kilojoules per mole. So mean absolute percent error over those 50 runs gives you a sense, a better sense of how the model's performed. In this case, it's about an 18% error, which Honestly, for measuring the enthalpy of hydrogenation on bulk materials is not terrible. We can both, we can plot the probability density of the mean absolute error and see that it looks reasonably normal. It's just one outlier in the group. Likewise, the mean absolute percent error and see that it's more or less uniformly distributed around 18% with a single outlier and most things sitting between 16 and 20% mean absolute percent error. Then we can print out and uh, plot the 
predicted enthalpy versus the enthalpy of formation in a so-called parity plot and see that while largely they do fall on the parity line, we do seem to be over predicting a bit, particularly at the low enthalpies, the enthalpy of formation. Uh, the, in this particular instance, the Pearson correlation coefficient was on the training, on the validation set, wasn't much better than 0.8, which is good enough to start with, but is not near an ideal model. You can also sort of split out and see what the holdout validation mean absolute error is consistent with the validation. And so forth. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to use my time to emphasize is the reproducibility of our work. And so the original manuscript that was written around this paper was actually done with Magpie, which was a Java-based machine learning framework developed by Logan Ward and Chris Wolverton a number of years ago. And when we were building up this framework for the boot camp, we decided that we would go with uh, Jupyter and IPython and MapMiner because they were sort of becoming more commonly used in the community. And so one of the first things that we thought to check was how reproducible is this work? You know, we used Magpie to generate the models previously, and now we're using MapMiner. Do the models even equate to one another? We're using the same featureizer, the same ideal random forest, but we're using two different implementations. Magpie was Java-based and used Weka's implementation of random forest versus this version that we're using right now, which is using the scikit-learn implementation of random forest. And then the question is, are, are they equivalent? All right, so this is the same notebook as you guys have, but it's in Jupyter Notebook. So we actually performed the same set of analysis with Magpie. We ran 50 times controlling the random seed number using the identical validation and training split that we used to generate the models for MapMiner. So these log files are contained in the drive that you have access to. You can run through them as well. Uh, what we see is that qualitatively, the predictions from Magpie on the holdout data set look similar to what we saw from MapMiner. Again, largely they follow along on the parity line. There's a group particularly at low enthalpy where it seems to be over predicting the enthalpy of formation. But then the question is, from a statistical standpoint, how consistent are they? So here we import stats from SciPy. And again, we can check the mean absolute error and the mean absolute percent error. Run through them. Oh, huh, that came out empty. Okay, I don't want to do this for a risk of uh, dropping something. So this is, again, a parity plot. This is the MapMiner enthalpy versus the MagPy enthalpy. And similar to their predictions previously, you saw that they do follow nicely on the parity line, but there are a couple of things to observe. They are not Although we use the same cross-validation, the training validation split, although we're using the same holdout set, although we're using the same random forest parameterized using the user configurable parameters identically, although we're also doing the same composition holding out that we were talking about previously, the predictions, while similar, have very different variants 
from one another. Um, in particular, the Met minor predictions seem to have a very large variance. And so what this means is that if we'd only run the model one time off and check the parity between the two of them, we might have lucked out and they might have sat exactly on the line, or they might have looked very different from one another, or statistically with some noise. Um, this is sort of a little concerning, right? From the material science machine learning standpoint, the variance in the models, just changing using Weka versus scikit-learn for random forest, indicates that just making changes or making sure that your models are identical from the user configurable parameter standpoint is not sufficient to ensure one-to-one -one reproduction of the of your work. Right. And so making sure that when you document your data, you let them know which version of scikit-learn you use, what platform, what version of MapMiner is absolutely vital to reproducibility and thus trustability of our work as a field in a whole. Um, I'm pretty much at the end of this now. So about a good time. And if there are any questions, I'm certainly happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Jason. So uh, for the entire audience, again, if you have questions, please post them on the, in the uh, questions tab. And uh, we apologize for the minor issue of the uh, collab. So we will try to fix that and provide a downloadable uh, link later. Okay, so I just have one question. So can you uh, give us some insight about, for example, if we want to model a high entropy materials with multiple components, uh, what would be the strategy to create the descriptors in your case? Will you look at the structures or will you look at the, just the chemical formula or and uh, can, you, can you guide us on this? Sure. Um, so this is something that we've actually been looking at for some time and there was a really nice paper out of uh, PNNL, uh, Michael Gao was one of the co-authors for that, where they were building models for predicting whether a material would form a high entropy alloy or not. Um, it sort of depends on what's your, um, what, what's your output? What are you trying to model? So uh, we've tried one hot encoding models for the structure of the material, FCC, BCC, will it form a high entropy alloy or not? Will there be inner metallics present? Um, and then you sort of have the option after that of building a separate model to drive towards a property that you happen to be interested in. Um, modulus was a very popular one for high entropy alloys. Uh, likewise, melting temperature, although I don't think that's a particularly great model. As you get to more specific types of properties, you probably want to start to stretch out the descriptor set. Um, yeah, my, well, my, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my question would be how, how will the machine uh, learn about the fact that there's uh, multiple components and a high number of possible configurations associated with this high entropy? Uh, just simply from the number of components or which um, will be so, an important descriptor, by the way. Um, so we've been using the MapMiner set of descriptors and we've been augmenting them with a couple of uh, heuristics that are sort of consistent with Hume-Rothery rules. Uh, there's also this really wonderful paper uh, looking at the ratio of the enthalpy of formation over the uh, entropy of formation and temperature and relative atomic sizes. You can, we've also been, um, one of the places that you can go to create more descriptors is you can look at uh, phase diagrams, right? Or you can start to pull in uh, things from CalFAD. Those are great ways of augmenting the set of descriptors. I don't know if structure is gonna quite get you there. I don't think a, uh, uh, how to say this, 
doing like a radial distribution function of the structure and trying to use that to build up a model of this of what will form a high entropy alloy or not probably is not going to get you there okay i see okay thank you so let me greater check. concern honestly is um what are you using as your training set because i haven't found a good one yet okay great uh so uh it looks like we don't have any more question at this point so uh thank you jason again and uh, uh we will be uploading these recorded videos to our youtube channel aps gds and we also provide we will provide link to solve this uh google collab uh, problem and uh, again thanks the speakers thanks everyone for attending so uh, we'll be having more uh, GDS virtual seminars in the coming weeks. P uh, please stay tuned. Uh, you'll be receiving emails from our uh, uh, IPS GDS. Okay, so I think that's all. We'll end uh, today's session. Bye. Oh. I will stop recording.